like to um, thank everybody for attending. And as uh, well said, this is a first. It's the first time that we have done programming in partnership with the chapter for chapters um, specifically. Um, so everybody on here should be a member of some type, roughly, um, so you should know who I am. But in case you don't, I'm Johanna Hutchison, the Executive Director of the International Sculpture Centre. And um, we have some staff members with us as well. Um, we have Jeanette Dahl, who's the Associate Director. I can see Gina, um, who works in events. I see Manji, who works in membership. I feel, I feel like that kids program where you point out where everybody is, but there's a couple of, I can see Jennifer. I can't see everybody because there's a whole screen, but the staff are here and I see lots of TSG members and other people that have been part of this ISC for many years. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be going on this new journey, which is really focusing on membership as the most important thing about the ISC. We always know it's the most important thing about the ISC, but we created a new platform just when the pandemic hit. So it was an ideal opportunity for us to really use, utilize that platform and build on membership. And one of the um, main ways of working more with membership is through chapters and groups. So um, we're delighted that Wells and Sabine uh, reached out to us to start this conversation going. And this is the first of what we hope would be many. So I think with that, we should launch into the program. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Joanna, very much for the introduction. And we're excited to be here. Um, Sabine, would you um, uh, talk a little bit about TSG? Sure. I like Thank you first for, for hosting us and for welcoming us. The TSG, the Texas Sculpture Group, is like China said, it's one of the four official chapters of the ISC. And we have been so for, I think, 10 years now. The ISC is celebrating 60 years. We have our 10th anniversary. So it's a big year for us and the ISC. Um, our mission is to support sculpture, to support sculptures in Texas and beyond. And we do so by hosting exhibits, hosting symposia, hosting uh, networking events, art talks like these. And I've got a really cool, strong team behind me that do that. Wells is one of them. He organized this event today. I have Leticia Bahuyo on the call who did a symposia down in Corpus Christi at the university for us. So this is what we do to support our members and we did so even more so during the pandemic because it was more important to get our members work out there and we are teaming up now stronger than ever with the ISC to have the same mission. And so this year we kicked off with an in-person exhibit in Houston that was also organized by another of our board members, Sharon Capriva. We are proud to support International Sculpture Day on April 24th in Dallas with a museum exhibition curated by Patricia B. Meadows. So that's going to be an exciting one. We are just having work selected for that. We will be celebrating our 10 year and the 60 year of the ISC in, at the San Angelo Museum of Fine Art in July. So I'm looking forward to that. And actually Johanna will be curating for us. So there's more work and teamwork and collaboration there. We're going up to North Texas in September to Plainview with an exhibit. Um, and then we are very, very proud to support our members with our first nation that's coming up. And this is what it will look like. And we will feature our members actually in our first ever book about sculptors, for sculptors that we will, it will be available um, in museum shops, in art galleries, and at our events. And this is our mission. This is what we do. And we're accepting curators as members. We're accepting art professional, artists, anyone who loves sculpture. And that's what we support. And of course, uh, uh, just like the other chapters at ISC, you don't need to live in Texas to be a member of the Texas Sculpture Group. So anybody on the call here today, um, uh, you're welcome to join us. We've uh, We've got a a very active program throughout the year. And Sabine is our, uh, she is our, uh, our, our leader. She's the president of TSG. And so, uh, and she'll be helping me with this event today. Um, uh, thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Joanna, uh, Jeanette. And 
Uh, my name is Wells Mason. Let me talk a little bit about what we're, we're here to do today. Uh, I'm really excited about this. This is a, an art talk that we're going to have with, uh, with two um, heavyweights from the art world. We've got uh, Maria Carolina Baolo uh, from Buenos Aires, and she's a, uh, she is an arts writer, also a curator and an arts historian. And uh, she's also a writer for Sculpture Magazine and she's agreed to field our questions. Uh, today we've also got Daniel Kunitz, and he is the editor-in-chief of Sculpture Magazine. And, uh, and he's, uh, the two of them, uh, Maria and Daniel, are going to field questions. I've got a list of prepared questions uh, uh, that I got from, uh, that I assembled from working with, with my team at TSG, Texas Sculpture Group, a list of questions for uh, Maria and Daniel. And then, uh, and we're going to do that list of questions for about 20, 30 minutes. And then um, uh, during that time, everybody on the call, I'd encourage you to, to, uh, to ask your own questions in the chat box. There will be an opportunity uh, toward the latter half of the, uh, this, this discussion to ask your own questions. And if you want to, you can ask your question in the chat. Um, and Sabine uh, will ask that question, your question, uh, to Maria and Daniel or... If you'd like to be unmuted and ask your question yourself, we can arrange that as well. So just let us know if you'd like her to ask your question or if you'd like to ask the question yourself. Um, also in the chat, I encourage everybody on the call to introduce yourself. Uh, tell us, uh, uh, you know, for instance, where you are and where uh, and what kind of work you do. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's figurative bronze sculpture. Uh, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so feel free to use the chat for that. Um, I can tell you that uh, that I'm. Uh, dialing in today from Austin, Texas. Uh, Jeanette uh, is dialing in from, uh, from Fort Myers, Florida. Daniel from Delaware. Uh, he's from New York City, but he's in Delaware today. Uh, Maria from Buenos Aires. Um, Sabine from San Antonio. So we've got people from all over. Uh, please do tell us uh, where you're located and, uh, and tell us a little bit about who you are. And thank you for joining the call today. Um, so, uh, uh, that said, why don't we start the uh, why don't we start the conversation? Um, I'm, I, like I said, I've got a list of prepared questions for uh, for Maria and Daniel, and their questions. We're going to be covering a lot of ground, everything from uh, NFTs to the importance of marketing and networking to Instagram to Sculpture Magazine to uh, uh, how do you quantify uh, uh, the value of art? So we've got a lot of questions for Maria and Daniel. As we're asking questions, if these questions uh, generate more questions, like I said, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear from you toward the, uh, the second half of the call. Uh, so I'm gonna start with, a, uh, with my first question for Maria. Uh, uh, Maria, thank you for being here this morning. Um, my question for you is, uh, uh, you know, you're, a, uh, you're an art, uh, art writer uh, and, and curator from, from Argentina. Uh, can you tell us, from, from your perspective, what trends you're seeing as a result of the global pandemic? Okay, um, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for this conversation. Um, I'm an art historian, so um, curating and writing came later um, to me. Um, what I see is, um, I, I went through the... the, the the questions um, in a very light way because I wanted to keep it like fresh and not give it too much thought about it. Um, what I'm seeing and experiencing at the same time um, with the shows I'm curating actually is there's something <clears throat> um, in the global situation that um, is related very, very uh, intensive. Uh, it's very intensive, intensively, real intensively, I think it is. Are related with um, ecology and with um, group situations, every kind of group situation. Political uh, art is um, is really um, like taking the, the take, taking the lead. Um, also, um, the gen uh, the gender stuff, you know, everything related with the gender and reivindication of the of the voices that have been silenced, not only gender, but um, this um, black, thing, ma black Lives Matter and, and all around that. I mean, everything that is related with um, working in group, working, working as, uh, as a collective, 
um, this um, sense of belonging to a place or belonging to a or, 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 or having a kind of a um, interaction in different races and different um, um, countries and, and I mean, that's what I feel is the most uh, interesting thing that is going on around now. And besides that is the multidisciplinary, you know, artists are breaking their own, um, their own limits and barriers and they're starting to work uh, thinking about other media and thinking about the, I think that that comes later in another question you were asking, but thinking about um, how they can interact and taking the manual to uh, a technological um, a technological uh, degree, you know, it's like trying to to reach both. So everything is starting to break instead of um, encapsulating. That's what I feel. Instead of encapsulating and um, and the confinement and, and staying like within the collective, it's just like from within, people are trying to expand, and everything turn um, is starting to be more ephemeral. Um, art is becoming that, that that's what I'm experiencing around, experiencing around right lots of exhibitions with a funeral art people are starting to concern more about the message and the concept than the, um, than actually keeping something material like um, oil painting that lasts for 500 years they're more concerned about the message and leaving something um, behind that has to be with uh, that, has, that is related with the concept than the materiality of the piece itself. Um, I don't know if I answered um, the question. Yeah, no, you did, you did. You actually uh, mentioned several different things. Uh, and that brings me to a follow-up question that was on the list. Uh, you mentioned politically motivated art. And uh, uh, do you feel like there's an ebb and flow to politically and motivated art? Well, um, th th that's uh, something interesting because mm, there's a great uh, difference uh, between political art and art as a political um, action itself. Um, these are not my lines. These are Walter Benjamin's lines and Didi Uberman, which, is, which are uh, people I, as a historian, I studied a lot and I appreciate it. In a conversation in 34, um, Walter Benjamin, in the author as a producer, he wrote, he said that um, the action itself of producing an image um, it was an, an, an action of uh, something like that. It was like a statement of liberty because, and it became political. Why? Because of the action of choosing something, of producing an image which has a political content because of the liberty of the choice, not because of the content itself. And that's, that's what I, I, I was meaning about political art. Art becomes political because it's a choice. The images are a choice to produce and images are not innocent. Never, ever. So one thing is art as something um, political because of the choice of producing the image. And the other thing is when it has a political content. And the first one for me, um, it happened everywhere, every, every time in, in the, it, it happened, um, I mean, it was never innocent. I was ever, never innocent. Images were never innocent since the beginning of times. But art is um, with a political content, that's something different. And both things are happening at the same time now, exponentially, you know. It always happened that art is political, but I mean, right now it's like um, with, the, with the technology and the internet and, and the possibility to reach thousands and thousands and the Instagram and, and I mean, it's a constant flow of information and, and brainstorming. So, so making politics through art, it, it's a, magnificent resource right now with the technology available. Thank you. But so, there are two uh, different so things. That, that's what I mean. There are two different things. The political content and the image itself as, as a political action. And I believe every image is a political action because you, you take a, a position, you, you, you say something with every image you produce. And it doesn't have to have a political content itself. That's, not, that's what I think. Mean. And, and, and images are never, ever innocent. I, I, I can't agree more. I, I love it. Uh, so, and they always have to be analyzed in the correct context. They were produced, right? You can't just, you can't just take them um, like 
you have you need some um, historical distance distance okay. of course but you can never analyze something 400 years ago or 50 years ago without um, getting the context where the image was produced social cultural intellectual whatever everything has to be understood to analyze the image Excellent. So co Thank you. comparisons, comparisons are sometimes uh, without these uh, insight, they are really um, not correct. I believe. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so next question I've got, and, and great answer, um, is for Daniel. Uh, Daniel, good morning. Could you weigh in on NFTs? <laughs> yes, thanks for uh, asking me an easy question to start off with. Um, <laughs> um, NFTs, for anybody who doesn't know what an NFT is, uh, it is it stands for non-fungible fungible token. And what that means is that it's essentially a, a piece of code or data in, uh, embedded in or, uh, or utilizing blockchain technology. And what that means is that you can't copy it essentially, or that, that any copy that's made is, is recorded. The, every, every time it, it comes with its own provenance. So we know who owns it. We know, we know if it's been copied at all. Um, essentially it can't be copied. Uh, it allows you to make a monotype of uh, an image, say, um, a digital monotype. And I have a lot of thoughts about them. Um, but uh, uh, first of all, I get, I mean, th the very first thing to say is that it, it, it's just a tool, right? I, I mean, it's just another tool. And maybe one day we will get to a place where uh, you could use an NFT to, um, to secure a photograph or a video and allow it to be traded or sold securely uh, without, without fear of it being copied. Um, that may happen. I don't know. Right now, it's an event in the art world, uh, or, or sort of the art world, um, and and uh, and in that sense, I think it's a uh, a symptom of a of a larger problem, or 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 something that's been going on for a while, um, and that is uh, twofold. One is um, uh, the increasing um, uh, digitization uh, of art, meaning that we are um, increasingly not incur encountering it in person, but rather um, through mediated technologies, through social media, et cetera. Um, and to the increasing financialization of art, these two things are completely related. Um, and uh, meaning that, uh, that, that somebody else later on asked uh, uh, whether, <laughs> whether there were any aesthetics left or, or whether it was all quantitative. And this is a, certainly a big step uh, uh, and, and argues for the quantitative um, uh, side of things, that, that, that art has become increasingly just quantified. Um, and the, the, the best example or the best way to think about what I'm saying, I think, is that almost all new real news in the art world is financial news. It's not about a new, a new way of making things. It's not about the hottest artist. It's not about an argument between styles or approaches. It's not, you know, um, uh, abstract expressionism versus pop art, you know? Um, it is, it is uh, you know, how did somebody manage to sell a six, you know, a, a bunch of uh, NFTs for $65 million or a single NFT for $69 million. Um, or, you know, how does, how did somebody uh, auction off a, a, a self-shredding artwork? Uh, so I, I think it's, it's a, um, we'll see how it sorts itself out, but for the time being, it is, uh, it, it, it represents this, this financialization that is pushing art increasingly toward um, just being a, 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 a something tradable, um, a, a collectible, say, a, rather than something that you might want to contemplate um, or spend time with or even encounter in person. And it, so, so that is concerning, is, is what I would say. That, that's my take on uh, NFTs. You know, we've seen some uh, some different interesting uh, phenomenon, you know, uh, uh, as a result, you just come across through the art world. I mean, everything from uh, a urinal is art to a banana tape to a wall. 
to NFTs? I mean, do you put this in the same um, same category as a uh, as a fleeting, or do you feel like it's a uh, it's something that that might be here to stay? Well, I, I don't put it in the same I, I I don't put it in the same category as the, those other two things because those were artworks, and this is just a means of 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 uh, of either of delivering an artwork, so, right? Yeah. So right. a urinal as artwork is, a, is, a, is a, an important concept in, in the history of art, one that, that, that very much changed the way all of us think about art, right? It, it, it challenged, it, it said that from now on, art is gonna be, um, that its prime motive is gonna be to challenge what we mean by art. That's fine. Um, the banana on the wall is, is doing the same thing but that but 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 it's in the realm now of, of finance again because it's it's look i can stick a banana on a wall in an art fair and sell it um that's the comment being made it's still art and we can talk about whether it's good art or bad art an, an nft is not art an nft is simply i mean you the, the vast majority of nfts are being used to sell collectibles uh, the, the first tweet by by uh by jack dorsey the founder of twitter etc it's not they aren't, um, it, is, it is simply a means of, of, of securing or, of, of, yeah, or, or distributing art so, and selling it. Um, so I, will it be around for a long time? Who knows? I, it very possibly, and, but if, it, you know, it, it, it probably, um, but, but it might change what we mean by art in the process. As a follow-up question, do you think that NFTs are a symptom um, or, a, or a byproduct of uh, the isolation that we're all experiencing as a result of COVID, or is it a byproduct of technology, or is it both? So NFTs predate COVID, um, but I think that the interest in them, uh, I, I think that COVID definitely has, has furthered the, uh, the, uh, the unfortunate trend of, of, of encountering art secondhand, um, again, through social media, through on the internet, um, and not, uh, and, and, and I think that's unfortunate because I, I, I think that art has two claims on two economies, uh, or a claim on two economies, on our attention and on, uh, on our pocketbooks, essentially. And to me, um, art is only interesting and powerful and meaningful in the culture as long as it can it, it claim uh, attention on our uh, uh, claim our attention rather than money. You know, simply um, money. To the extent that it is uh, that it that it claims uh, just our pocketbook and not our attention, it becomes ornament. It becomes decor. It becomes just a collectible without much meaning, cultural meaning. It might have meaning to you, but you know. Excellent. That's Thank you for uh, for for the feedback on that. It's a uh, this is a new concept to 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 many of us, but it's uh, so we'll have to watch it. And uh, is it something that you that you'll be covering in uh, in future issues of uh, of Sculpture Magazine? Uh, not unless there's something interesting done with it in terms of actually making art. So uh, right. uh, so far that hasn't happened. I mean, I, I would argue it really hasn't yet uh, i mean i think a lot of artists are using it to make works kind of the way they would they, they might use prints to make uh money from uh, as a side business on their on their main thing now they may be able to make a lot more money on prints than they could you know through paintings or whatever or, um or sculptures but uh uh but so far it hasn't really changed the way people are making art and as soon as a, an artist comes along who is who, who makes a significant contribution to that using nfts then i'm sure we'll cover it got it uh thank yeah. you daniel for uh for for the feedback on that so uh, uh here's a uh, here's a question that i've got from larry graber he's one of our uh, our texas sculpture group uh longtime members of texas sculpture group uh, and this is a question both for, uh, for Maria and Daniel. Uh, uh, Maria, and, and you, if you could answer first, that'd be great. Uh, do you see a pervasive international art style today? And if so, can you talk about how the different art disciplines contribute to its growth? And by art disciplines, I think Larry's talking about uh, not just visual art, but, but performance art, uh, uh, music, fashion, theater. Um, uh, but do you see a pervasive international art style uh, today from your perspective? Um, no, not exactly one. 
but uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, and, and there's something I just want to add to, to um, Daniel's um, answer, which I, I think, can I do that? Yes. <laughs> okay. I think it, uh, I agree with, um, with the answer he gave. I just want to add that um, as, as, as a historian, I just can't uh, stick to the idea that what we are producing now is only related to uh, merchandising, right? I think it's valid. It's it's valid that art um, that artists want to sell their work. What is not valid is for me, it's just producing art to sell, which I believe is what he, he was saying. In, in, in that, I agree. But um, but it, 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 it it's 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 also valid, you know, to have that um, that commercial um, point 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 of view. I mean, um, but not producing for that. Okay, art should should be encouraged to be um, something more like invite the spectator to enrich their lives and to 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 reflect. Right? If not, it's it's it seems it's not it, it has no meaning for me. But um, related with the with the answer, uh, what you were you were expecting about the other question? Um, no, I mean everything is like like what I said before. I think everything um, everything is like wide open right now. And there's not just like one trend um, that is um, leading, but what I see is that these um, technological um, platforms that are um, available now and that are making, the, um, making art and art pr uh, producing art um, on a digital um, way, that is what I think is um, if you want taking like the lead. So many artists working with extreme materiality, which I miss a lot because they are migrating to these platforms and, and the, the works are becoming more hybrid. Now we have here a, a very important um, uh, award that is called the Andriani Award. And one of the artists who won the Andriani Award, I, I, I wrote about him a mm, long time ago for sculpture. Um, he produces a kind of work which is just, you know, his name is Mariano Guido and he produces like small sculptures that you just see them and they probably mean nothing to you. But when you, you put, a, put the, the, um, the glasses and everything that goes with the digital work, everything around you, um, I mean, it, it, you, are, you enter in, 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 a, in a surreal world, you know. He's been doing that kind of work and working with the three-dimensional three di uh, three machines to produce sculptures, which are very interesting. But all of, all of this is ephemeral and it just it, it just disappears and something like that I mean leading materiality is something like I see that is um, taking the lead at the moment but all the other is is absolutely um, available as well and people who like to paint or like to draw or, or define themselves as painters or sculptors or work work with marble or work and they still do and very young ones but the problem that I see a lot in the, in the awards, for example, I've been uh, jury for many awards, what I see is that many artists who stick to the program that they believe is uh, faithful to their thoughts and, and the materialities they want to work with, for example, marble or, for example, wood, or, or they work like great big pieces um, in pedestals and everything like long time ago you would say um they don't get the award they don't even get like the interest the, the critics don't get uh, very interested in that they're always looking for something that comes out of the of, of, of what was already seen for example but that's a great mistake i believe because many people are continue a tradition and they are um, they're really sure of what they're doing and they study and they produce and there's a twist uh, a contemporary point of view that they insert in there, and sometimes they, um, it's not seen because it's like something like old-fashioned, and it's not like um, it's very academic, and that's not absolute truth. That that's something that all these um, new trends and all all these new ways of expression um, that technology is bringing us that is dematerializing um, materiality. Um, sometimes make us um, 
not see that some other people continue a tradition of work and craft, like um, putting their body inside the, the pieces in which takes month to produce just one. And I think that's very, very interesting, very valuable, at least to pay attention to. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, the world is, uh, is, is moving faster and faster. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to keep up. And it does feel sometimes like some of the uh, more traditional forms are, are, are often overlooked, uh, but I don't think they should be. Uh, Daniel, can you, can you speak to that? Is there a pervasive international art style today? Um, I mean, I, I agree with Maria that uh, there is not one pervasive international art style. There, is, there may be a, a number of, uh, of um, art styles that, 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 you know, that are common to, to your, you know, a number of international styles. Um, but, you know, if you had asked that question of us a year ago, I think we would be able to more confidently say these are the, the international styles. Um, right now, you had a situ you've had a situation in which people went into the studio for the last year and haven't necessarily shown the work that they've been doing. So it, it might look kind of different in a year is what I would say uh, than from, from today. But certainly a year ago, you, um, I mean, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, ephemerality is definitely a, um, is, is definitely a, a big trend, if you will. And that I would link to pushing back against the, um, the enormous power of the market in, in, uh, in art and, and, and pushing back against what really is probably the most dominant style, at least that one sees uh, displayed, and that is simply art that is easily transportable, easily digestible, easily sold at art fairs. Um, and that, that's an unfortunate kind of, uh, <laughs> of, of international style. But, you know, I don't know whether that will, that, that, that we can say that that's happening right now because the art fairs aren't really happening or not, not in person so much. Um, uh, but, you know, so, and then you can identify any number of, of uh, sort of pervasive tri tributaries to these these larger um, uh, uh, streams, which are, I, I would say, um, very material, very sellable stuff, and 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 then more conceptual, more ephemeral things that are trying to push back against that, um, uh, or or uh, and then there's versions of marrying those two things, and um, uh, yeah, it, it's but there's definitely not one international art style today. So I, I think we can all agree that that COVID has has changed the trajectory of of art making and and certainly international art styles. This is a follow up question to that question. This question comes from Sabine, um, uh, and this question is for both of you guys. Uh, do you see? Do you feel like online exhibitions are here to stay? Absolutely, but but that. Um, goes along with the um, um, go attending to the to the show as well. I participated. I'm, I'm I'm curating a show at the moment, which is absolutely online, and I'm also curating a show that is opening next month in a museum, in a national museum. And it's going to be. We, we are scheduling how the the opening is going to be like 50 people in in different. Um, um, like in different hours, and so both are happening. It, the, um, I would never, I would never um, go for um, replacing the the physicality, the physical experience. That I think that would never happen. And con continue with the last um, answer. Um, now the thing with the collecting art and buying art and making it all like transportable and easy to buy that happened before. I mean, everywhere, I mean, in Renaissance, Baroque, whatever, I mean, people collected a lot, not because they were interested in living with art, only living with art and beautiful art and, and things that enrich their lives, but also like, like to um, put the money there and see if they can make it more valuable sometime later. And now the thing is it exploded because of, of all these things that we are all connected because it comes uh, like this bug in, in, a, in a plane and we are all, I mean, we're all stopped. So everything's connected. That's why we are, um, we're visualizing it more. But um, 
that, that, that's what I, I mean. That, that was like connecting the answer with, with the other thing. But one thing doesn't replace the other. I mean, it, it's going to be presential and it's going to be a lot of virtual experience. And that I find it fine and great. And I think it expands the, the situation, not only because of the COVID. There are a lot of people with a lot of physical um, disability, a lot of um, psychological disabilities. It happened to me lots of times curating shows, people not able to attend because they were not living in Buenos Aires, because they were very far away, because um, they had a physical disease or, or whatever. And this allows them to have this streaming sometimes experience and they are, um, and, and the platforms from the museums and the galleries are being articulated just to give the, the others, the, then I'll, I'll can send you the, the link so you can see these experiences I'm talking about, these shows, right? You have like a vivid experience, even if you're not there. And this is not here to replace it. That's what I want to believe at least. It is to <laughs> bring... Oh, come on. This is not here I don't, to replace oh, I don't, it. I don't think it's... I don't, I don't think it's trying to replace it or at all I, it, it not, can. Not at, uh... it's a different experience it's, it's like um it's a different experience i i believe it will never 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 replace the experience of you in front of a mark rodko um painting i mean you can never replace that but what you can have is is like an experience where you approach to it when you can't do it you can't do it for, for every reason. Now we have a, this sanitary reason, but for every, whatever reason it is, you just can't do it. So this is another, uh, another way. And for people who has um, these uh, disabilities that I told you, this is, this is great. It's opened uh, an entire world to them. So I think it's great. We, we have to see the, the, um, the, the, the bright side of the moon here. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, these, these online e exhibitions, they occurred uh, before COVID, but they, they came front and center during COVID because of, our, of, our, of the shutdown. Um, and afterwards, maybe there'll be a hybridization of online and, uh, and physical shows. But, uh, but Daniel, do you feel like they're as, as legit? Do you feel like they're here to stay? Do you feel like there is a, a, a future for online exhibits that maybe in some ways is uh, can be more valuable than a physical exhibit? Uh, no to the last question. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I think that, uh, that, that they're definitely here to stay. Um, I, I, and, uh, and they obviously are a, a, a useful tool for people, you know, if they can't see art in person or, um, but what, the reason why I think it's unfortunate that they're here to stay is that I think that uh, you, they are training people. It's one thing if you've grown up without online exhibitions, um, and, uh, you know, uh, but, but they are training younger people uh, not to look very carefully, and they're training them to see art in a particular way, and that way is uh, secondhand. They don't, they don't look at, they, there is no sense of presence, there is no sense of, of compelled attention. Um, there is simply, you know, what, what, what catches you for, for an instant um, on, uh, um, on screen. And the reason is you're not looking at an artwork, you're looking at a picture of an artwork. Um, and I, I, I worry about the way we are training ourselves to look. That's what I would, why I think it's unfortunate that online exhibitions are here to stay, uh, or, or at least here to stay for, for, for the majority of people. If, you know, if you're using it because you can't be someplace and you need to see work, that's one thing, that's great. And, and you know, reproduced art has always had a, an important part or has for, you know, actually, you know, most of art history, most of, of, you know, modern art history, meaning the last 500 years, whether it be engravings or whatever, you're looking at reproductions, um, but nobody was taught to, uh, to, or thought that they were, uh, that they were, looking at art, they, 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 it was easier to understand that you were looking at a reproduction um, and, and, and you would be eager to see, to, to, to see the real thing because you wanted to study it, you wanted to spend time with it, you wanted to, uh, to, to let it claim your attention. And I, I think the, the, that we are uh, teaching ourselves to do the exact opposite of that. Um, with online exhibitions. And it's really, again, online exhibitions are a function of the market. They're not serving artists really, except for allowing them to make money, which is important, but, but they're not serving their art. <laughs> I don't totally agree to that, but it's fine. 
<laughs> no one really interested in art. No one ever really interested in art would stick to the program of just watching it by, by screen. That, that never happened. I'm, oh, I'm, there's kids all over. I, I meet them all the time. I hate to tell you. <laughs> okay, I mean, kids, but, but I don't know if that, kids, I'm, kids I'm not sure. Kids studying curating, kids, kids studying art who don't look at art, they look at screens. <laughs> you don't study curating. I, sh I, I, I teach at the university for, for, I mean, for possible curators, and you just have to have a background in the field. You know, you just, we, we schedule everything. We, I schedule everything for this uh, modern um, um, museum that we're, the, the Museo Decorativo de Arte Argentino here in Buenos Aires, and till the last minute, we will never know. We have technology, we have painting. I mean, we, we schedule everything, we settle, we, we settle it up, and, and we, we hire the people for the mountain, whatever, and the last minute it happens. So I think no one who really wants to live the experience will stick just to, to watching it. But I mean, teaching them, you can do that, but they're, if they're really interested in arts, they will travel, they will go, they will visit. I mean, COVID will go away, another sickness or whatever happens will come. And who's interesting will travel, will read. I mean, I studied by books. I live in Buenos Aires in Argentina. I, I, I wasn't, um, it wasn't able for me to visit uh, Europe um, all the time. Like, and, and I got a degree in history of art. So um, books helped me. Internet was not available at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm 44, so like 15 years ago, it wasn't available like it, was, it is now. So books um, are my best friends. And, and that didn't, um, um, I, I mean, that only made me want more, like to be there, to actually see it. You know, I think that will never go away. We shall I see. like to think that. <laughs> we shall see, okay. Uh, thank you both for that. Um, let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, we've got some young people on the, uh, the call today. We've got some, uh, um, several members of TSG that are, that are new members. Some are in school, some are students, uh, and some are just starting out in their career. Uh, Maria and Daniel, this is a question for you both. What would you say to encourage an emerging artist who's just starting out? You go first. Daniel, you first. That no matter what is happening in the art world, great art is always being made. Um, I mean, even if it seems, you know, so just go out and make, what, make the work that you believe in. <laughs> That's what I would say. And Maria? Same thing, same thing. Just do what, what you believe you have to do, no matter what the, the the market is asking for, no matter what the galleries tell you, uh, the gallery that wants to support your work will support it because of being genuine and honest and, and is going to support the way you think. But um, the most important thing is um, read, um, learn, um, and see. I always say that, see. You have uh, young artists who should go and visit, um, Go and visit uh, art fairs, everything, art fairs, galleries, museums, check the websites from another, um, from another uh, colleague and not saying, oh, this one did this, so I'm not able to do this kind of art. I mean, everything is invented. Everyone did everything. So what you have to do is just be the best you can do with the craft you're, you're performing. But um, I mean, see a lot, read a lot, visit a lot. Um, information, uh, knowledge for me is um, capital. Well, so here, here's a follow-up question to that. And this, is, this comes from, uh, from Sabine. Um, what do you suggest, uh, or, or rather, can you talk about the importance of marketing? Uh, and this is true for emerging artists and established artists. Um, we see, uh, you know, obviously Instagram and Facebook, uh, even people on LinkedIn, we see people doing their own newsletters, their own flyers. It used to be that uh, the Holy Grail was to get represented by a, a gallery and they would do the marketing for you and you could just produce, but that model seems to have changed. Um, uh, what do you, can you talk about the importance of marketing today for artists? Uh, and Daniel, would you like to talk first? 
Um, I'd be interested in hearing what Maria has to say. I'm not sure I can yeah. talk about the, the, the importance of marketing. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that a certain amount of marketing to, you know, is probably going to be necessary for any artist to succeed. Um, but what does that really mean? Um, in other words, is it super important to be marketing your work on Instagram and getting the right eyes on it? I don't know. I, I, I think you'd have to ask artists, you know, a, a group of artists that, to be totally honest, um, whether that, that that's working for them truly, or whether um, marketing in the sense of getting the right curator into your studio to, you know, or the right gallerist or the right set of, of you know the right art advisor um is is and 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 having and being able to talk about your work well that's a kind of marketing that that um might be important uh newsletters i i don't know i have no idea whether that's helpful or not it, it certainly wouldn't persuade me of anything <laughs> maria okay in my opinion i i work with uh, lots of artists and 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 collectors and galleries and what I suggest um, it, it's important to have a, um, a good website a good platform something aesthetic and interesting but related with uh, posting all the time in Instagram and promoting all the time like 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 some merchandise like Daniel was saying that I totally disagree and to say to go um, on that line I, I would say being a jury in, in some of, of the a juror some in some of the uh, of the awards the latest awards i've seen um people posting all the time with their presenting in the awards you know and that's really uh, it's really i mean it's awkward yeah, I, I believe it's 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 more interesting to keep some privacy to give the work a thought to 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 establish a dialogue with the pieces you're making and not all the time start like posting or details or showing others like showing off something like wanting the approval some something like that is happening that is really really um, weird i don't know how that's going to end very well I'm, I'm not i'm not sure i don't like it that much but one thing is when you post something to promote um, a show or an exhibition or you won an award or, or something like that, which is totally valid and it's fine. But when you, when all the time you start posting what you do for others to see, for others to give you the approval, I agree you should, I mean, you can invite uh, someone to your, to your studio. You can, you can make them have this experience with the work and not all the time by Instagram. And sometimes the pictures are, extraordinary and when you go you see the work it's uh, uh, it's it's annoying because they have nothing to do with, with the with the pictures they are posting and this is honest this is what happened in the awards you see because you select a lot of uh, folders and pictures and they are taken by absolute extraordinary um artwork photographers and then when you see them um they're they are i mean they're <laughs> nothing like what you've seen that's something that um, we have to figure it out. Uh, authenticity, I think, is, uh, is, has become ultra important uh, these days. So I've got one, one more question for Maria and one question for Daniel. Uh, these are plugs for uh, two projects that y'all are working on. And then I'm going to turn it over to Sabine. Uh, uh, and we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, Maria, would you talk a little bit about how you use Instagram? And uh, 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 I follow your account. I love it. I think it's great. Uh, talk a little bit about how you use Instagram and your work? Um, what I do in Instagram is like um, playing the curator um, part of me. It's like I make like this short experiences. Ten, ten images are the, the the top you can you can post. So what I do is like uh, use the feed of the Instagram to. I mean, just post, it, it post experiences, colors, design, um, whatever I see, subway, things that um, calls me attention. And I just make a group from different artists, always something related with art, always. And I tag all of them. So then, this is something interesting because they become, at the first, uh, I had Instagram um, like two years from now. And at first I didn't tag anyone, then someone, told me once, hey, if you're using my image, and then I automatically start doing that. 
And um, it's funny because they answer me in like in a private message, private message, and sometimes they share my posts and I talk to them and tell them what I do. So we start like an interaction and some of them are from Ukraine or Russia or whatever. And it, I just don't, don't, don't look at their accounts. The, the image captures my attention and I just make like um, a curator stuff selection and, and I post them and tag them and start this interaction. And then I use the stories for casual things that just disappear in 24 hours, which is something like a, strate uh, a strategic thing you have to learn to do. What you post in the feed, what you put in the, but nothing personal at all, nothing personal at all. Unless I wanna, um, I wanna um, say something to someone and that someone understands it and that's it but nothing personal, we just use it for work, and that's it. I'm post my work. So for those of you on the call, if you do have an Instagram account, um, uh, check it out. It's a, it's a really uh, cool account. Thank you. And she does curate uh, uh, wonderful mini um, uh, exhibitions on her, on her account. Thank you. Daniel, um, tell us, uh, not only are you the editor-in-chief of Sculpture Magazine, but you're also a writer. You authored a book titled Lift, Fitness culture from naked Greeks and Amazons to jazzercise and ninja warriors. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so that's a that, that was a uh, uh, book, uh, a cultural history of fitness um, that I wrote uh, a bunch of years ago, and uh, it doesn't doesn't have a huge amount to do with art. It looks at at the idea of fitness throughout uh, both um, time and cultures uh, and what it is meant, um, it, although. It certainly uses a lot of art history to to talk about that that subject, and uh, and since then, um, a lot of artists. Uh, there's just been an explosion of art that has to do with, um, I would say, uh, uh, physical practices. Um, and so now, in my mind, I collect those artists, not in real life. But uh, so anyway, yes, I wrote that book. I'm super interested in physical practices, uh, whether they're they're expressed um, in art or documented in art or expressed in art, um, but also just how people are uh, uh, trying to uh, change their bodies. Thank you. That uh, sounds like a, a fascinating book. I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out, and maybe there, there'll be a sequel. A sequel. Uh, yeah, something like, that. yeah, yeah, I'm, write, I'm writing, the, yeah, I'm thinking about things, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Keep us posted on that. Um, we, are, uh, we are running out of time. We want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions from the audience. Uh, Sabine, have you got some stacked up in the, uh, in the chat? Yes, we have a few. We had a lot of comments here on, we covered a lot of ground, obviously. Yes. Um, on the topic of, well, A, the NFTs have obviously been... Uh, of, of interest and I get to that in a minute but talking about how you market your art uh, is it necessary yes a person would say it is and here's a question from um, I think it's Raquel Carklin to bring attention to one's work is it important to know how to talk about your art and I think that's a very poignant question because many many artists do not like to talk about their art or feel we express ourselves through the art Otherwise, we would be public speakers. Yeah, I'll jump in on that for a second. Just for, I do a lot of studio visits, and um, I, I, you know, whether you like it or not, I do think it's extremely important to be able to talk about your work and talk about it clearly. Um, I, I, it's it's, and I, yeah, I, I think that's extremely important. And, and you and and there is a direct correlation between how well you talk about your work and how. Um, how well you do out in the world with that work, I would say, in my, in my experience. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, to learn how to talk about it. But do you have any tips? Well, what's a good approach? To no, no, just being, or... just be clear about what you're trying to do. I, there's nothing, it's, it's really just uh, it's people who, who have a, or, or a good spiel, if you will, are able to, to talk about what they're doing, why they do it, what it means to them. Clearly, um, to the point, well, uh, tends to really help people in a, in a studio visit, certainly. Does that make sense? And that goes into the commercialization again, yeah. because a good salesman, the art scene. And absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that it's making money is still, you know, important for everybody. <laughs> but not only because of that, because for me that I, I'm interested in, in, in 
on finding artists to curate shows or to write their, their art um, texts, not their manifest or statements, but their um, like critic te texts. It's not all about money. I'm interested in them um, and encourage them all the time to be able and to and to be fluid in explaining, in tell in, in telling me what they what they are doing, how they are doing it, why they are doing it. Um, which is not the same as explaining the, the, the works themselves, you know, sometimes they can't speak about um, the entire concept because always uh, I think the, the work, uh, the piece of art has, um, speaks a language we don't speak entirely, right? So we don't understand it like all, uh, completely, that's the interest uh, uh, for me in arts. We never find the, the, the concept that is for, for once and forever, right? It, it keeps growing. But being able of talking about what they produce and why and how, it's very important. I believe. I agree with you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, there's one question back to the NFTs. Are NFTs relevant to 3D work, to sculpture? Not yet, but they may at some point. I, I, yeah, we'll, see, we'll just have to see. Um, I, I believe uh, Beeple, the guy who, uh, who, who sold the, uh, that NFT for 69 million and is the reason why we're all talking about it, um, is now trying to produce a 3D Beeple experience based on <laughs> NFTs. I don't know how that'll work, but, uh, but, uh, but that, that, is, that is happening. Um, but so far, I don't think it is. <clears throat> I think those were the, the, the foremost question on our chat. Unless anyone else has something, um, we can open the mic or feel free to type it in. There's a comment from Jeff Owen. It helps to be excited about your art and sharing your excitement with people. This sells you and your art. And I think that's very true for sure. I've got a question for uh, uh, for both Maria and Daniel. Can you tell us about the artwork that you personally collect? Hey, very easy for me. I don't collect any art. <laughs> Not at all. Zero. I, I collect it in my mind. I just like to see and experience it. I'm not interested at all in owning things. <laughs> a minimalist. Yeah. <laughs> minimalist is a kind of art too. And it's collectible. So. Sure. <laughs> I have lots, I have lots of, of work of art. And um, some of them, I, I mean, I'm, I'm related with them affectively only, only because of that. They, they are pieces that I gained um, working or I, I changed for, for, for my work, I exchange um, the work, and some of them are gifts, which took me a long time to, to accept because I have this um, ethical um, debate, and I talked to several of my colleagues and said, this is happening to me, people sometimes want to give me a I don't accept everything, I accept what I find um, that is interesting for me, that it comes with, you know, with love and passion, and from the artists I respect and love. But I have, yes, I have a, a, a small collection and humble collection that, that I love. I have lots of paper, lots of paper and photography and some sculptures, small ones, and painting, bit of everything. Thank you, both. I've got a, another question for you too also. Um, uh, and we'll start with Maria on this one. Uh, as a curator, can you tell us what sort of parameters you apply in evaluating works of art? That question comes from Larry, another question from Larry Graber. Uh, do you have a set of parameters that you use? And Daniel, the follow-up for you would be, as an editor, what sort of parameters do you apply in evaluating artists that you feature in your magazine? I start? Yes, uh, Maria. Okay. Would you start um... I think I mentioned something like um, of it before. Um, I'm interested in art that makes us life um, richer, um, that makes us reflect. Um, of course, aesthetic is important, and if they go together, that's fine. But only aesthetics, only, it's not a, not, a, not of interest for me at all, at all. So whenever, uh, if the show is about photography, um, if, uh, if I, for example, I don't know, if I have to curate a show, 
And I don't have to curate a show. If they invite me to, and I agree because I like the artists, because they are interesting, um, because I find they have something to say and working together, um, that is going to um, take us to a superlative experience. That's what interests me, uh, challenges me. Um, but not because it is nice, not be I, I don't, those kinds of appreciations I don't have because it is beautiful or because it is ugly, because it sells or not, that is something that I'm not interested in. Not at all. Never, it never was interesting to me. And Daniel, um, how do you, what kind of uh, parameters do you apply in, uh, in choosing the, the artists that you cover in, in Sculpture Magazine, uh, the ones that are chosen to be featured? Um, ideally, so it, it starts with passion. So we choose artists to, to, to cover um, based in an, in an ideal situation on, on somebody's passion for them, usually a writer or somebody on staff. So somebody comes to me and they say, I want to write about this artist, or interview them because I care about their work. And, um, and then there is a whole set of, uh, you know, of, of, ex, of, of criteria around that as to why you might do it. I mean, um, there's usually some kind of show involved, although there does not have to be. Uh, and I like, but you know, I don't have to like the work um, at all. I just have to think that it matters in some way um, or that the person who wants to write about it uh, wants to write about it because they care about it you know, uh, and, and, and has good arguments for doing so. If it's me, if I'm evaluating some, uh, an artist for me to cover, um, it's, I, I, it has very little to do with the artist at all. It has everything to do with the art they're making. Um, and that's a whole set of criteria. And, and that criteria is, uh, um, I'm, I'm interested in art that compels my attention, as I've been saying. Um, uh, does it stick in my memory? Do, do I think about it once I've seen it for a while? Um, clarity, uh, and this goes back to, to being able to talk about your work. I think clarity is an under, uh, uh, an under focused upon quality. Um, it doesn't have to be, that doesn't mean like it can't be abstract or, or fuzzy, but, but I mean a kind of clarity of intention. Um, uh, uh, surprise, formal vitality in, in some way, um, critical edge. Uh, I, and I am also interested in whether it shows some kind of, a, of awareness, um, both of contemporary art and the historical context in which it finds itself so, or, or is aiming towards. So I'm not really concerned whether it likes, you know, there, it, if it's trying to be like contemporary art, but, I, but some, of what, some, some sense of, of, uh, of, of what's going on in the world. And um, all those things matter to me uh, in terms of when I'm trying to evaluate an artist. Uh, usually when I'm trying to uh, evaluate whether somebody else should write about an artist, it's more about the writer and whether I trust them. So, uh, so one thing that I, that I earned, uh, learned early on was the, uh, the idea of an elevator pitch. I'm sure many people on the, uh, this call here heard that, that three minute um, uh, description of our own work as if we were in an elevator with a Hollywood producer. Uh, and yeah. that might be a good, uh, a good tool for some that's of the- a story, That's a story, the, um, uh, that's the Jaws story. The Jaws story. <laughs> Jaws story, how it went. Oh, that's what, uh, and my, my first, uh, that's what I learned in university when I was studying cinematography. Yes, that's what the, the writer was, the producer uh, gave like three minutes to, I don't know if it was a producer yeah. of Jaws going on an elevator. And he says, um, he said something like, um, I don't know how to say it in, Eng in, in English, but um, it was like, um, like this super big, um, super big um, shark. How do you, how do you, uh, shark, 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 shark attacking attacking a beach full of pe of pe swimming people, something like that. Like you said, that's it. It was it was a line like that. But that's a story. It it comes out from from, from that story how Jaws was was finally done. So, so, <laughs> Sorry so, about this. But... No, it's wonderful. So talking about your work, uh, being succinct about your work. Passionate Absolutely. about your work, uh, uh, but basically doing good work and sharing. And knowing how to, and knowing how to transmit it. 
right. then when you get the shot, when you get the shot, you get the shot, you just have to be able to, to like in, in those, not even three minutes, like in, in one line, just to, to hit, you know, to, to strike. Well, uh, I, I think we're, uh, uh, we're at the end of this conversation. I think we're, we're running out of time here. I've actually got more questions I could ask. Uh, and I think everybody on the call probably uh, is, is, has got more questions for you, uh, Daniel and Maria. But uh, like I said, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out and turn it over to Sabine. Uh, but I just wanted to tell, uh, tell everybody that, uh, that we, we enjoyed this. Uh, uh, speaking on behalf of TSG, Texas Sculpture Group, uh, we enjoyed the opportunity to be here today. And, and, and I'm super grateful for Daniel and Maria and also Jeanette and, uh, and Joanna. So uh, that said, thanks for, uh, for, for taking part in this. And we look forward to the, uh, to the next event that ISC hosts. Sabine, I'm gonna hand it over to you. You're, you're paused. Thanks for having us though, it's a pleasure. Yeah, Thank you. Help. yeah, I can only reiterate that. I think it's fantastic to get the opportunity to, for our members, for everyone here to, to get FaceTime with you guys. I think it's amazing to hear the, the, the background and your thoughts on trends on how you see the art world. I think it's a one-off opportunity and I appreciate that the IC is working with us on that and I'm hoping we can do many more of these. So thank, every, thank everyone for joining us today and we hope to do that again soon.